All right. Well, guess what? It's time to begin. So we're going to go ahead and get started. My first introduction of the day is Scott Acuno. Dr. Acuno has been a generous partner to the EHG Foundation, providing us his time and his guidance. And he has been instrumental in supporting the EHG Foundation with projects through the years. Uh, Dr. Acuno at the Mayo Clinic Rochester will be providing us an overview of EHG. So please welcome Dr. Acuno. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for the organizers of this uh, conference. It's a great honor and pleasure to be able to share with you what we actually know about EHE. This presentation will go over information that sets the groundwork for the whole conference for the rest of the day. If you're new as a patient, hopefully this will be helpful. If you're a researcher that doesn't spend a lot of time seeing patients, hopefully this will be helpful for you as well. And then clearly I'm a clinician here and hopefully this will resonate well with other clinicians as well. We'll break down the talk today on the demographics, what we actually know about the diagnosis and build on what we had last week. We'll spend some time talking about the clinical course as well as some treatment options, knowing that the rest of the day will be more clinically oriented. So as we move forward, we have to remember 1982. Some of you might not remember, but 1982 was a very important year. 1982, the movie E.T. came out. In 1982, Michael Jackson Thriller was the number one album. Yes, there were still albums back then. But also 1982 was also a very special day for all of us because it's around that time that EHE was actually formally recognized, although it was there before, as an entity. And from here on out, we'll call it EHE. So what is the EHE and, and like who is affected and what is the typical course? Well, we know that the vast majority of the individuals are women, one and a half times compared to men. We also know that about 20 to 30% are actually picked up incidentally on other scans when they are done for other reasons that are asymptomatic. The typical range of someone diagnosed with EHE might be in that 30 to 40 range. All as you can see, the range is quite broad from 80 to 80, from eight to 80. We always wanna be one in a million, but the incidence is actually about one in a million. So if you have EHE or studying EHE, it's, it's a very rare disease. The demographics also kind of hint out that there is actually about four different diseases. You can have liver, liver dominated disease that occurs in about 21%. It could be lung dominated or bone dominated or the rare ones. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about the more common one, which would be the pleura and the peritoneal. So what is EHE? Well, EHE is a rare vascular tumor. As we said, it's incidentally found most of the time on imaging and it's, from a pathology standpoint, we heard last week, it's a very bland nuclei, meaning not very aggressive under the microscope at times. There are some typical immunohistochemical staining that could be there. But I think what really changed this is the translocations. And there are actually two translocations that we typically would think about. TAS, CAMTA, and YAP, TFE3. Last week, we really dug deep into this area here, and we know that about 90% of the EHE do have the TAS, CAMTA translocation. We also know that about 10%, if studied, will have the YAP, TFE, B uh, translocation. And it also kind of goes to show you that the more we start to understand EHE, the more we actually don't know, and there's more that we would need to know as we move forward. But what is the pathway of TAS? Yeah, well, it's on a HIPPO pathway, and I know last week a lot of information was shared about this slide. We spent a whole day last time talking about the pathways around this activation of YAP, TAS. Today I'm not going to spend time there. But it also kind of reflects, I hate to say, whatever we see for any tumor, it's not very unique, 
Well, clearly you do have the vessel wall. You do have the immune cells and somehow those tumor cells evade the immune system. They do circulate through the system. They somehow get through and into the tissue. They can get through the basement membrane and break through and cause problems there and they can spread. And this cartoon does show that it can go anywhere it wants. And part of what we as clinicians know is that this same pathway exists for every single tumor. What's very unique about EHE is that there's a pathway that's built out around that, and we heard a lot last week about that. So from a radiology standpoint, you know, most of the time we do CT scans, and that's come to an emergency room with abdominal pain. You come with shortness of breath. You get a CAT scan to make sure you don't have a blood clot. But there are also some CT, MRI, and bone X-ray findings. We also know that PET scan can be used, and PET scans are radioactive material using usually sugar, radioactive sugar, but we also know that dotatate is also an active agent and also can pick up disease as well given the natural hist uh, the propensity for dotatate or somatostatin to be picked up for EHE patients. So if it happens to be in the liver, radiologists can pick this up pretty quickly. It tends to be multifocal in multiple spots. It tends to be at the edges. They tend to coalesce or they could have a confluence. And what's unique about EHE because of the long history, they do have some calcifications. Words that sometimes is used in the radiology litters, they have a halo effect. They have a little bit of a, a lollipop effect. So sometimes you can have some clues that it might be EHE in the liver. If it starts in the lung, it tends to be multinodular, it tends to be reticular, and the one that's very discerning for us at times is the one that has both lung and pleural involvement, or just pleural involvement. Pleural is just the lining of the lung, sometimes without any spots in the lung, and that's a very difficult uh, attempt to try to diagnose because it's not very evident of what's going on. They just present with pleural effusions in the lining of the lung. If it happens in the bone, it tends to be osteolytic, punched out lesions. They tend to occur in the long bones, in the arms and the legs, mostly in the lower extremities compared to the upper extremities. And if it does involve some of the bones in the, the middle of your body, and mostly in your spine, maybe clavicle and ribs, but they can occur in any location. We all wanna know what's the prognosis. How do people do? We know that with surgery, there's about a 15% chance of recurrence. We know that in the course of their disease, maybe 20 to 30% will have evidence of spread beyond the local disease. As we already said, 20, 30% actually have evidence of spread of disease at the time of diagnosis. And what's very unique about EHE is that not every single EHE patient behaves the same. Everyone is different in the variable clinical course. Throw out some numbers here. The overall survival is pretty good at one year, 90%. Five years is 75%. And what's unique is that generally the survival is roughly the same if you have one spot versus multiple spots in different organs. Very unusual disease. That's not very typical of what we see in other tumors. We also know that the cause of death generally is pulmonary progression or the pleural disease. And even if you have pulmonary lesions, you have a very good survival as long as you're asymptomatic with the median overall survival over 180 months. We do rely on the pathologist to give us some clues. Is this EHE going to behave more aggressively or going to behave more indolently or slowly? And there are many different ways that we heard last week as well that sometimes it's a mitotic activity, how many cells are going through division. Sometimes we know the bigger the lesion is more than three, three centimeters, there's a higher risk for uh, progression. Sometimes there's more cells in there. The two as a clinicians that we know are going to generally have more progression is if it's involving the lining of the lung, pleural effusion, or if it if, uh, is in the abdominal cavity, 
Also, if you happen to be a male with EHE, they tend to have a worse prognosis as we said. Setting the tone, there are basically three main options that we have for treatment. Local, that might be surgery or ablation. It could be systemic therapy or drug therapy here. And then if it's unique, it'd be liver transplant, which uh, we'll hear as well. The main thing as a clinician, we have to say, is treatment needed actually? Or more importantly, when to start treatment? Because the treatment doesn't need to start the first time you see a spot. We sometimes need to see the natural history. As we said, every EHE patient is different. And the real thrust and the real importance of a clinician is when to start treatment. The local therapies, as you can imagine, would be surgery. It could be radiation therapy. It could be some radiology intervention regarding embolization, cryoablation, or radiofrequency ablation. And there have been no head-to-head -head comparisons, which is the best route for them. We would like to know, but we don't. Because most of these are sent to sarcoma doctors, and most sarcoma doctors know vascular tumors such as angiosarcoma, a lot of the drugs that we've used in the past have been dedicated to vascular sarcomas, and you can see them. And we'll hear more about that later. We also know that a very unique aspect is the mTOR inhibitor that can be used. Sylvia will be talking about this as well, and they presented data in January here talking about the role of serolimus to the natural inhibitor. And this will just give you some ballpark figures of kind of the numbers that we're looking at. When you start drug therapy, you know, you probably have about a 10, 12% chance of it shrinking. The vast majority of the time you stop the growth, you have some stability, and you get some idea that the median survival with those that need treatment is around uh, a year and a half to two years. So we'll hear more about drug therapy and systemic therapies when treatment is indicated. And the one thing that we know and is borne out even in Sylvia's paper again, is if you do have evidence of uh, involvement of the lining or effusions, they do worse compared to those that do not have effusions. And you can see both the progression-free survival and the overall survival. And that resonates as a clinician that those that have pleural involvement or ascites do worse no matter what. Chuck will talk today about liver transplant, but you have to realize that there is liver transplant if it's liver dominated disease, but you also have to realize that local surgery the 10 nodules might be as good as liver transplant, and we'll hear more about that. We also know that even if you have this disease outside of liver, the dog do well. So it's very unusual. The vast majority of the time when we do liver transplant, it has to be liver dominated, but for EHE, that's not the case. Chuck will probably go over this as well, and you have to realize that the one, five, and 10 year survival, even with advanced disease, only in the liver, even outside the liver, really doesn't matter. That 75% are still living here at 10 years. We've done some work here. Dr. Groats is a surgical oncologist, and you can kind of see here that even up to 10 nodules, up to five years, you still get around 80% survival. There's been no comparison between the two, but remember, surgery might be an option, and we do consider surgery alone, not transplant, in selected patients that might have 10 nodules. We'll hear more. This here kind of shows you the curves of the different survival depending on the number of nodules. So we can use this as a reference to suggest what is the best options for individuals. So as we end today, the takeaway is that, what do we know about EJ? Well, it's, it's a rare vascular sarcoma. It occurs about in a million and the course is very variable. We do know that there's a translocation. TAS, CAMPTA-1, and YAP, TFE, three, and the vast majority will have one of those two. We know that the course depends on where it's affected, if it's liver, lung, or bone, or if it's involving the lining of the pleura. There are some drug therapies. Some of them are serolimus and some are other treatments that are geared towards 
sarcoma that are vascular. We know that the poor prognosis is normally if you have pleural or parietal involvement. And that liver transplant or local therapy, if it's liver directed disease, does have a role. There's so much more we need to know about EHE, and this conference does help set that tone. We do have opportunities through the EHE. One is the biobank, and we've heard about that. We've, we're excited about the opportunities of the biobank. And we're also very excited about the EHE retrospective tumor registry to kind of go back and look very hard at what's going on uh, in patients that have had variable courses and try to select out ways that we can improve our therapies for our patients. With that, I end and I thank you for the time that you've shared with us, and we look forward to a great uh, day. I hope that this set the tone for the rest of the talks as we go forward. All right, we've got a couple questions from the audience here. First question, in lung EHE, can you comment about ground glass and opaque comments on radio uh, radiology reports? That is correct. Um, typically when we see, well, that's a, an important question because when we see patients that have EHE or other solid sarcomas, we typically look at solid cannonball lesions in the lung. EHE and other vascular tumors occasionally will not have the typical solid part. They could have what they call ground glass or hazy appearance. Some of those hazy appearances could be from pneumonia. Some of those could be related to the drug therapy that we're actually given. So it becomes a challenge is how much of that haziness is actually disease? And how much is it something else? And trying to put a needle in haziness is very hard. So if we really want to know what it is, sometimes you have to go and physically take out that haziness in an appropriate situation. So this is where you need a multidisciplinary group along with you know, pulmonary radiologists, clinicians that know about EHE potentially, as well as thoracic surgeons. Now, when you mentioned uh, taking out the haziness, what are you referring to there? So typically, if you have a ground glass appearance and that's the only spot that we see, we would watch it. Typically, however, in EHE, there are multiple ground glass appearances. And if you don't know exactly what it is, at some point, you're going to need to figure out what that is. Um, and either that would be with a CT guided biopsy or going in physically removing that. So this is where the clinician will have to decide, I have some spots, haziness in the lung. What is it? We usually watch for some period of time. Maybe treat with antibiotics if you're a primary care or pulmonologist. If it just doesn't get better, then you have to go to the next step to figure out what it is. Got it. Thank you. And we have another radiology question. Uh, so again, in radiology, what about comments like bone islands and scoliosis in bones? Yeah. Well, bone islands uh, are typically bright spots or very dense spots, and radiologists are pretty good at figuring that part out. Those are not EHE in general. Foliosis just means curvature of the spine. That is generally unrelated to EHE. That's an, another problem. Got it. And we just got another question that came in. Is the poor prognosis with lung involvement only for patients where the disease arose in the lung? Or do patients with EHE that arose in other tissues and then spread to the lung also have poor prognosis? Uh, that's a good question that I should, I want to clarify. If it goes to the lung or starts in the lung, that's not necessarily a bad prognosis. When it goes to the lining of the lung is when it becomes a poor prognosis. So if it starts in the lining in the lung or spreads to the lining of the lung, that tends to be a poor prognosis. Uh, when we say poor means generally more progressive, more symptoms. Well, if it's just in the lung, you can have lungs, as I noted, for years and they barely do anything and they barely cause problems and you might not even need to treat those. 
So if it spreads to the lining of the lung is where it becomes a poor prognosis. And then that's the case, uh, whether it originated there or spread to there from another location? Correct. What happens sometimes as in the lung grow, they become more con, you know, conglomerated, and they will then eventually start going to the lining of the lung. The problem is we don't always have that luxury of seeing somebody go through all those stages. Sometimes they just come in and they've already had the whole kabang happen to them and they were asymptomatic for 20 years and we didn't even know it because we never did an x-ray. So this is why when we hear the discussions around drug therapy, and I think so other groups will talk about it, is where in the disease course are you really going to intervene? Got it. We just got a question and where about... Where we have the maximum benefit of that. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, sorry. I want to make sure you got your answer complete. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we got a question on the anatomy related to the lung uh, in terms of the lining. The question is, uh, is the lining of the lung um, on the outside? And then specifically, I think it's asking, is it also on top? So where, where when we look at the lung anatomy, is the lining uh, geometrically around the lung? Oh, yeah. So we were trained many times. It's a very hard concept to think about. But the way we're trained, it's like a balloon. So if you take a balloon and put your fist in the balloon, your fist is touching the lining. And if your fist is the lung, so it lines the whole lung. The outside of the balloon lines the whole chest cavity. And typically, there's no space between that lining of the balloon on the inside and the balloon on the outside. However, as time goes on, there's fluid that builds up or air that builds up and there's a space between the chest wall and the lung. And that's where that lining is. And it goes from the top all the way to the side, all the way to the back, all the way to the middle of your chest. So it is everywhere. So if you drop something in the top, it'll go anywhere through the whole lining lung from the front to the back to the side everywhere. In terms of where you see uh, EHE lesions, um, is it um, somewhat random uh, in the lining or are there certain uh, areas, top, middle, bottom, front, back, that you're seeing? The vast majority, I think it's gravity probably. It's usually in the lower parts. Got it. Got another question that just came in. Uh, it says, I saw recurrence at 15%, but have heard that with transplant, it is higher. Can you please comment on this? Right. That was a general statement. Um, Dr. Rosen will be talking about liver transplant, and he'll give you more data on that part. Um, we've had patients who've undergone liver transplant, who've had recurrence, who we've not treated again, and they've been doing well after liver transplant, even with recurrence, needing no additional treatment. We just follow. It's a very unusual tumor. Got it. And a question related to um, pharmaceutical treatment. So with a rare cancer like EHE, you're typically not going to see uh, companies developing new drugs or investing the money to go through an FDA trial. But what you'll see as people are figuring out these biological pathways, is existing on market drugs may uh, may work for this disease. As a clinician, at what point in that research are you comfortable uh, using those on market drugs that are approved for other indications off label for EHE? At, you know, how far does the research have to advance before you're comfortable as a clinician trying one of those drugs with a patient? We would typically say that the vast majority of our drugs that we use are not FDA approved labeled drugs. They own studies, but the drug companies don't want to spend time and money to register them for that indication. So if we have good evidence based on clinical trials that it's active, even though it's not FDA approved, we feel very comfortable. As we heard, we definitely don't want to give drug therapy that's ineffective, toxic, and does not achieve our endpoints. And what are our endpoints? Ultimately, we want people to live longer. Well, you heard the variable. It's very hard to know. So we have surrogates, shrinkage rates. But maybe shrinkage is not the main thing because in EHE, maybe shrinkage is not the right thing. 
or the time that you can live without the tumor growing or progression-free survival. So as you hear the talks today about drug therapies and the benefits, rethink that question again and say is, wow, would I use that? Would I take that as if, if I'm a patient? We'll see. So we're very comfortable at using it because that's what we do a lot in oncology. So thank you. Got it. And we ended up uh, having a couple more questions come in last minute here, but uh, we're out of time for the Q&A session. So if you, I don't know if you're going to be heading to the main session, you might want to check the chat main for session. those additional questions. And um, okay. we will thank you for your time today and uh, turn it back to Jenny. Ah, uh, muted myself. Sorry about that. So thank you, Dr. Akuno, for um, all of that information and for taking us back to 1982. Thriller and ET are classics. Um, also, as you mentioned, EHE is one in a million, and it's not easy to live with EHE. And patients of, patients often feel um, very alone. But I will tell you today, as I'm sitting here, we are not feeling alone. Um, it is amazing to know that this kind of research and care is occurring for this cancer just 39 years later. So thank you, Dr. Akuna, very much for your time.